Hello, this is three stories to celebrate the Puka's pageant. Three stories each linked by the theme of shape-shifting. We begin long, long ago in the lands of ancient Greece, when Aristeus, that most handsome, most dashing, most charming, most talented, most gifted of demigods stepped out into the world from his house and journeyed down across his fertile and wonderful lands to the place where he kept his apiary, his beehives. And even as he came within a few yards of the beehive, something set his nose to twitching, something intuitively came to him that there was something wrong. Or perhaps it was not so much intuition as the simple dawning realisation that he couldn't hear any of the normal things that he would hear as he approached his beehives. Chiefly, of course, the humming of the bees, for there was instead silence, deathly silence spread across the land. And into that glade he stepped, that glade where he kept his hives. And there the hives still were, but there upon the floor were hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of dead bees. And even as he walked towards the hives, stepping on the corpses of these bees, hearing them crunch beneath his sandals, as he lifted up the lids of the hives, he saw even more bees dead within the hives than dead upon the floor around the hives. And his heart, his heart grieved for Aristeus loved his bees passionately, deeply, not only for the, the soothing drone they make upon a summer's day, but for the fertility that they brought to his land, pollinating all of the plants and the flowers, the herbs and the vegetables and the fruit trees that he had growing upon his land, and for the honey itself that he would harvest regularly from those hives, to make wonderful cakes with, to brew the most exquisite mead with, to, to make the world a joyful and wondrous place, all of these being skills which he had taught to the human race. The, the harvesting of plants, the tending of fruit trees, the making of mead, the brewing of what honey wines, and, and endless, endless skills that he had travelled the length and breadth of the world teaching to humanity, before deciding to retire back to his, his farm for, for a rest and to enjoy the fruits of his labours, and yet here, here was a terrible, terrible blow. For not only was the, the loss of the bees tragic in and of itself, but of course it meant that his plants would go unpollinated, his fruit trees would not come into fruit, because there were not the bees there to, to flit between blossoms and flowers. The mead would, well, he had his bottles, still stashed in the, the core cellar in the earth to drink, but after they were drunk there would be no more mead, no more honey wine, no more honey cakes. His heart was heavy. And he thought to himself, who do I know who would understand the problem here? Who would understand why all my bees have died? Why the world is silent of humming? Why the flowers go unpollinated? While the trees will not be in fruit, who do I know? Who do I know? Who would understand these things? And it came to him. It came to him then, why none other than his own mother, Serene. Serene, who was a nymph, a creature of the wilds, a creature of nature, who traversed the worlds hunting and shooting and fishing and, and, and exploring the joys of life and usually killing half of it, but who was nonetheless in tune with the tides of nature. He would go and ask his mother. And he knew that at this time of the year she was often to be found down by the sacred pools communing with her sisters, the water nymphs. And so he travelled many a long mile down to the sacred pools, and there he waded in up to his waist and called for his mother and called and called until, bubbling up from the surface where she had been down in the depths of the sacred pools, in the deepest parts, communing with her sisters, up she came to find out what her son wanted. And he explained to her the plight that had befallen him, the, the plight that had, had 
rendered the the bees dead and the, the flowers unpollinated the trees unable to fruit he said mother will will you must know that you know so much about the natural world you must have some understanding of why this is and serena said on on her journey she had well encountered many things but no solution to this she had heard of small numbers of bees dying for, from this or that illness but not entire hives and dozens and dozens of hives for she knew how many beehives her son kept she, she'd never heard them all being wiped out at the same time this, this was a mystery to her and, and a great concern to her for she loved the, the, the wonders of nature and the thought that whatever had wiped out Aristeus's hives might of course spread to wipe out other hives it weighed heavily upon her mind and she said well, what i don't know there is one who might my cousin your second cousin second cousin first cousin i've never quite understood the relationships between cousins but my cousin proteus the wise man of the oceans he knows everything there is to know about everything but but my son he is not the easiest man to pin down. You will find him, if you hang around long enough, by the seal colonies, for he has special care of the seals of the ocean. And I suggest you do this. Wait for him to be at rest with the seals, and when he is sleeping, when he is resting, creep up upon him and seize hold of him. And you will find that Proteus is is a strange man a strange beast indeed for whilst he knows everything he does so partly because he can become everything and he will twist and he will turn and he will change shape after shape after shape but you must hold on for grim death because if you once let him go he'll be away and you will never find the answers to your questions so hold on and hold on and hold on until he tires of changing shape then he will answer your questions and let me know what the answer is because I too fear for the blight of the bees. And she sank back into the waters of the sacred pool. And Aristeus, not wanting to waste another hour, at once turned round and headed towards where the seal colonies were upon the, the great beaches by the ocean. And many an hour he walked to get there, but he walked determinedly, and at last he came, sandal sore and weary of the heat of the day. And there, as the the day was drawing long, he sat and he watched and he waited. And eventually, as the seals emerged from the ocean to bask in the dwindling light of the day, he saw a figure, a man, arise from the oceans. He'd never seen this relative of his, this Proteus, before, but who else could it be? A man amongst seals but Proteus. Up he came out of the ocean waves and he walked amongst the seals and the seals looked up at him and, and smiled and, and, and made seal noises gonking and squonking and welcoming him in, in to the seal colony and at length he found a rock with a seal either side and he lay down upon the great flat rock basking and as he lay back Stretching, he shape-shifted and turned and became a great seal of the ocean. The largest of the seals there, a king amongst seals, the herder of the seal people, guardian of the silky races, as they say in Scotland and in Ireland, if, if not necessarily in Greece itself. And so, following his mother's advice, for he was a good Greek boy, Aristeus crept quietly amongst the seals, cautious not to wake any of them up lest they give the alarm until he came to the great flat rock on which this king of seals this proteus was basking and lying very gingerly at one side of the enormous seal he reached round and grabbed the seal and of course proteus woke up and, and squawked and hollered and, and thrashed and tried to free himself but could not for aristeus was holding on for grim death and no matter how much he twisted and turned, he would not let go. So Proteus did what Proteus always does in such circumstances. He shifted and he turned and he changed. And suddenly Aristeus found himself holding not a seal, but a bear. Roar! 
thundering and waving his paws around. And then suddenly it wasn't a bear, it was a horse whinnying and kicking and thrashing. And then it wasn't a horse, it was a wolf howling and twisting and turning. And then not a wolf, but a great sea serpent struggling and writhing in his grasp. And then not a sea serpent, but a dolphin. And then not a dolphin, but an eagle. And then not an eagle, but an elephant. Shape after shape after shape, Proteus twisted amongst them all. Until finally, finally he grew exhausted. And he became that human-like guy as again. And he lay there huffing and puffing and gasping and wheezing and saying, Who are you? What do you want? And at length Aristeus introduced himself as a distant relative. And Proteus rolled his eyes and said, Well, if you were a relative, you could have just asked. You didn't need to go to all this panada. But done was done. And Aristeo said, well, my mother recommended it. Did she? Did she indeed? Said Proteus. I shall be having words with your mother. Ask your question then. And so Aristeus put the question of the bees to Proteus. And Proteus fell silent for a few moments, thinking and recalling and reflecting and said, Ah, I know what it is. I know what it is. You are under a curse. You are under the curse of the nymphs. And so it is the nymphs who have caused all of your bees to die, and they may cause many another bee to die as time goes past, if you do not appease them. For you have earned the wrath of the nymph and the wrath of the gods as well. How? How? When? said Aristeus. Well, let me see. Do you remember back you were walking, oh, years ago now, walking amongst the hills, and you saw a beautiful woman in the distance. You saw this, this glamorous creature, this, this young maiden with dark long tresses, and you fell in love, or should I say in lust with her, and you chased her, and she turned and saw you coming, and she ran, and she ran, and she ran, until you lost sight of her. And having lost sight of her, you lost interest in her. Dimly said Aristeus, who had chased many a beautiful maiden and quite a few beautiful young lads as well in his life. Uh, and, you know, one maiden becomes much like any other in the distance of memory. Well, that maiden, said Proteus, was the beautiful Eurydice. And Eurydice, as she turned and fled and left your sight, disappeared off amongst the trees, trying to escape your unwanted embraces. She was so busy looking behind her to see if you were still chasing her that she was not looking where she was going, and so she trod directly into a nest of vipers. And the vipers wrapped around her ankles, hissing and spitting, and they bit and they bit and they bit, until the viper's venom was coursing all through Eurydice's body, and she fell dead upon the floor. Eurydice. Eurydice. Aristeus had heard that name before. Eurydice. Oh, you fool, said his distant relative Proteus. You fool. How can you forget such a name? She was the wife, new, newly wed wife, of Orpheus the Bard. Ah! And so it came back to Aristeus, who knew well the story of Orpheus the Bard, of how he had mourned for his beloved until his heart ached, and of how he had journeyed into the land of Hades, the land of the dead, ruled over by the god of the dead, and tried to bring Eurydice back to, to, to life, back to the world above, and had made a bargain that she should come back to the land above so long as she walked behind him. And he walked ahead, leading the way, carrying a lantern that she might follow. But that he, Orpheus, should never, ever look back upon her until they were fully out in the land of the living. And of course, as is so often the case, the instant you tell someone not to do a thing, the idea plays in their mind until the foolish time when they go and do it. And so he had looked back upon her, and in the act of looking back he had sealed her fate, and she was dead to him forever, and could not leave the underworld. And Orpheus had returned to the land of the living, grief-stricken and heartbroken. And what it had become of Orpheus was the stuff of legend. <laughs>
and it was such a legend that Aristeos himself had heard. And an, until that point, sitting on the beach, surrounded by seals and an angry relative, he had never connected the maiden he had chased, who had disappeared from him before he'd even so much as had a, had a, a grope or a snog. He had not connected her to Eurydice, to Orpheus, to the great tragedy that befell all in the sanctuary. And in that moment, in that realisation, that dawning of what his unwanted lusts had unintentionally visited upon that poor woman and upon her heartbroken husband, in that moment he understood why the nymphs were outraged, why the gods were outraged, why vengeance was demanded. And in that instant he felt even more heart sore that the vengeance had been visited upon his poor bees, indirectly upon him rather than up front and direct upon him in some more uh, plague of boils or something of that sort. He said to Proteus, oh, I do indeed regret that man. I, I, I had no idea she'd die now. But done is done. It cannot be undone. What must I do to appease the nymphs, to appease the gods, to make amends for this terrible act I have so unwittingly performed? And again, Proteus thought. And he listened to the sound of the sea rushing in and out the ebb and the flow of the wave. And as a being of the sea, he could understand the noises of the ocean and the knowledge came to him, maybe whispered by Poseidon, maybe whispered by Themis, maybe whispered by one of the many other gods and goddesses, who knows. And he said, you must make a great sacrifice, a great offering. There are 12 gods in Olympus. You must make an offering of 12 cows, 12 head of cattle. And you must perform these sacrifices. And this time, unlike a normal sacrifice, you may not partake of the meat yourself, but must give the entirety to the gods. Leave the 12 bodies laid out in offering in the sacred glade. And three days after the sacrifice is made, return. And you will see whether the gods have accepted your act of contrition. But again, as you walk away from the sacred place, after you have made your sacrifices, and again after the three days, when you have your answer, you, like Orpheus, must not look back. For if you do, all will be lost. Well, this was a, a, an expensive, a, a hefty sacrifice to make, 12 head of cattle, given away of no benefit of, of, of meat, nor milk, nor, nor hide, nor anything, given and gone. But he had done a terrible thing. He had not realised it at the time, but he knew now he had done a terrible thing, and, and he, he pledged in his, his heart, in his soul, that he would never make that mistake again. He would never pursue anyone who was so clearly unwilling that they were running, screaming for the woods to get away from him that such a tragedy should never happen again. And whilst he was thinking these, these thoughts of his own future, he went and purchased 12 head of cattle, a great expense, and took these poor beasts to the place of sacrifice. And there, one by one, he led each cow into the glade, away from the sight and, and hearing of the other cows. He made the prayers, he made the offerings, he poured out the libations of wine, and then he slew each animal in turn. He offered them in sacrifice and laid them out in a great circle, one after another after another, twelve dead cattle laid out. And he thought of, of the people who could feast upon such an enormous offering. It would feed a village for a month, if not more, probably a lot more than a month for 12 head of cattle, but this is what the gods and the nymphs demanded, and so this is what must be offered. 
And so following the advice of Proteus, the great shifter, the great changer, the one as fluid as the seas, he walked away from the glade, facing away from the glade, never once looking back, even when he heard strange howls and cries as of the dogs of a Hecate walking around the dead bodies of the cows, even when he heard crunching of bones, the slurping and slobbering and gulping, even when he heard strange footsteps and the distant sound of drums and of flutes and of harps, he never once looked back. Even when the hairs on the back of his neck were standing up, he was so afraid of what might be going on behind him, he never once looked back until he was far away, out of sight of the glade, out of hearing of the glade. And he walked all the way to his home and there sealed himself in and decided that he would fast for the night, whilst others, whatever they might be, were feasting. Three days and three nights he waited, as Proteus had recommended. And at the end of that period of waiting, Aristeus turned round and walked towards the glade. A long journey it was, but he went there. And as he entered the sacred glade, he made the necessary prayers and poured out the oblations of wine. He cast a fistful of balm before him. And there he saw not twelve head of cattle laid down in a circle, but he saw the bodies of the twelve cattle, what was left of them, suspended from the branches of the trees that grew around the outside of the glade. Ropes around their hooves, their two front hooves holding them up. And he dared not approach too closely, for he was very nervous. But he saw that each of these corpses had been eviscerated, their innards gobbled up, devoured and gnawed bones lay upon the floor that had fallen out of the carcasses. And in each of the carcasses, he saw movement and heard noise. And at first he was all fit to run screaming into the darkness, for the moon was already creeping up. But then, he mastered his fear and he listened a little more carefully, a little more closely as to what that noise was exactly. And he realised it was a very familiar noise. For the sounds he heard were not a, of some monstrous entities gnawing away at the innards of the cows, but at the buzzing of bees. That familiar, relaxing drone. And he heard it not from one carcass, but from all twelve. And he realised that each of these twelve carcasses was now home to a colony of bees, a, a hive that had taken up residence in each one. And he gave his thanks to the gods and to the nymphs for their forgiveness, for his unseemly act that had brought about the death of Eurydice and the grief of poor Orpheus. And he took the carcass of the cow hanging in the tree nearest to him, and the other eleven he left for whomever they may be fit for. And he very gingerly carried this great carcass with its beehive inside it, all the way back home, back down to where he kept his beehives at the edge of his land. And there he laid the carcass down, and the bees at once flew out of the carcass and took residence in the hives that had previously been inhabited by the old swarms of bees. And those bees, for as long as Aristeus was in this world before he journeyed up to Olympus, and that was an awfully, awfully long time, those bees thrived. They produced the sweetest honey. Their singing, their droning, their buzzing would relax the most troubled of souls. The flowers and the trees across the lands of Aristeus and all of his neighbours were as fecund as fecund can be, had so much fruit, and, and flower and, and heavy with pollen from the comings and goings of the bees. They, they were amongst the most fertile lands in the whole of Greece. And as to the other eleven head of cattle, 
with their accompanying hives. It may be that other people were drawn to that sacred glade to collect corpse after corpse and take them to wherever they may have taken them to. Or it may be that those sacred bees are waiting there still for the day when foolish humanity, having bereft itself of bees and offended the gods in a multitude of ways, can make atonement and perhaps replenish the bees supply with some divine swarms from the sacred apiaries. But there ends the story of Aristeus and the bees. Now our second tale brings us to a much colder climate, a much more distant land. And it brings us to a time in history even further back than the time of Aristeus. Much, much further back to the dawn of Asgard. Now Asgard up in the heavenly realms is the home of the gods, the home of the Aesir, the gods of the Norse people. And these days, of course, it is a grand and fortified place. But back then, when this story takes place, it was not quite so grand, not quite quite so elaborate, not quite so enormous, and certainly not fortified. There was no wall around the realm of Asgard, and the gods had discussed amongst themselves on many an occasion how to protect themselves from the intrusions of fire giants and frost giants and all manner of other awful creatures that existed in the Nine Realms and would occasionally seek to raid the land of the gods as they raided each other's lands and raided the lands of anyone who couldn't run away fast enough, frankly. And different gods and goddesses had suggested different possible solutions. And it was in the middle of one of these debates that a great knock came upon the doors of Asgard beating upon those huge great oaken doors, the sound echoing throughout the palace of Asgard. And the servants went to open the doors and, and show in the visitor. And in came this scruffy, lumbering man. Small, odd-looking, somewhat pungent. And he doffed his cap and... made his introductions to the gods and they raised an eyebrow at him and said how may we help you what do you want and this strange scruffy man said i i have heard that asgard is unguard it Badonch. and the god said well yes yes it is and i have heard said the scruffy little man that you seek solution to this problem yes we do well, I have a solution to suggest to you, and it is this. I am a master builder, and I will build the most enormous impregnable wall around the whole of Asgard. The whole of this realm shall have a wall around it, built by my own fair hand. And this wall shall be impregnable. And the gods sat there and thought, ooh, well... If he can do it, that, that would be an amazing thing. And what, said Odin, father of the gods, well, most of them, what do you want in exchange? And the scruffy little man said, my price is a fair price. I ask only this. The hand of the Lady Freya as my wife. And the Lady Freya, who was but a few paces away, looked absolutely horrified at the prospect that she should be married to this scruffy little man. But before she could say much of anything beyond spluttering with surprise, the scruffy little man continued, and, and, I should like the sun as my own, and, and, I should like the moon as my own. And is that it, said Odin? The hand of the Lady Freya, and the sun, and the moon. Oh, that, that's it, that's all. Ooh, ooh, said the Lady Freya. How very dare you! All 
you do not ask for much. A goddess as a wife, the sun and the moon as your personal ornament. <sighs> Loki, from the back, chirruped up. No, 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 let's listen to this, let's consider this deal. And ducked just before Freya could clock in one. Let's listen to this, for if this man can indeed build a wall impregnable to the frost giants and the ice and the fire giants and, and all manner of other nasty bugaboos that are in the world, then, then this is worth, worth our giving consideration to. Well, Freya would have none of it, but Loki eventually, eventually managed to calm us. Just, just play along, play along, play along. There will be, said Odin, after some thought, conditions. Indeed, I am sure there will be, said the scruffy little man. What are your conditions, mighty Odin? And Odin said, after some thought and consideration, The time is coming soon, with the onset of winter, when the frost giants become restless and begin to consider their attacks. Can you have this wall built in the passing of a single season so it is ready before the start of winter, before the first day of winter? Can you do that? I can, said the master builder, for I am indeed a master builder. That is, that is not beyond my scope, but beyond my aid. Well, if we pay you, said Odin, we shall pay no other. There can be no other workers in this task, no, no assistants, no, no employees, no staff, no slaves, no minions to assist in the building of the wall. For one payment and one payment only will be made, and that is the payment you have asked to you. But I need no other, said the scruffy little man, except, that is to say, my horse to help haul stone around to build the wall. Oh, well, well, a horse is a horse, said Odin. That, that doesn't count. Horses don't get paid. You may have the horse. But, said Odin, if you fail to build the wall in time, if winter starts before this wall is completed, then you will forfeit all payment. And, and still Freya was not terribly amused by this, even though Loki kept nudging her in the ribs and, and winking at her in that peculiar way of his. She would have none of it. But Odin was the king, and the king lifted his mead horn and pledged to the scruffy little man that the contract had been spoken. If the wall was built in time, his would be Freya, his would be the sun, his would be the moon. But if the wall was not built in time, then no payment would be made, neither Freya nor the sun nor the moon. Odin drank from the mead horn. The scruffy little man drank from the mead horn. The deal was sealed, and the scruffy little man went about his business, and Freya very nearly lobbed the mead horn out of the window. But Loki said, Let's leave it to me, leave it to me. I have a mind so contorted I could be a lawyer. Leave it to me to work out a way around this contract. And Freya whispered to him, in the subtlest of tones, that if he failed to work it out, and she found herself lumbered with that scruffy little man as a husband, then he, Loki, would pay for it for the rest of eternity. Well, the gods watched. They all came down. Frigga, Ulda, Sif, Thor, Iduna, one after the other, they came down and they watched the building of the wall. They watched as that scruffy little man lumbered off down to where the dwarves lived, taking his horse with him. And they wondered to themselves, how, how on earth is he going to build a wall as big as he's bragging in the amount of time he's, he's saying he can do it? How, how is that possible? And they watched as that scruffy little man with his horse and cart behind him came back up from the land where the dwarves lived 
and on the back of that cart, being pulled along by the horse who barely even seemed to break a sweat doing it, was half a mountain. Cast upon the back of the cart, and then they realised that this scruffy little man was clearly no ordinary scruffy little man. That this was some some trick, some magic. This was perhaps a giant, or, or a dwarf, or an elf, or something magical that was using its powers and the powers of this horse, which was clearly no ordinary horse, to pull such a gargantuan load. And having pulled back this half mountain to the edges of Asgard, the peculiar little man set to with hammer and chisel, working at vast speed, to cut that half mountain into great massive blocks and to place block upon block upon block upon block to build the wall and each block was so cleverly made so cunningly carved from stone that he needed no mortar just that there was a you couldn't even fit a fag paper between the great stones that made this wall they were so well and precisely carved and cut and whilst it takes a while to get through half a mountain get through it he did and then he was seen to be going off a few weeks later with the horse again to haul up the other half of the mountain and this was then laid around and then another half of the mountain a few days after that and on and on it continued the wall became higher and higher perfectly made and of a thickness that all of the gods agreed as they oohed and ahed and looked at it even Freya agreed that if the rest of his work was up to the standard of the work he'd done so far, there was no way that fire giants or frost giants could cross such a wall. It, it would be impregnable. And while she still didn't want to get married to this weird little man, or whatever he really was, because he clearly wasn't just some weird little man, nonetheless she could see the, the value of the deal that had been struck in terms of this wall providing safety to her kith and kin. Day after day after day passed and the wall got longer and longer stretching round and round and round the outskirts of Asgard and it got higher and higher and higher with turrets and battlements and places for guards to walk and to watch from towers and, and you name it this wall had it. And all of the while Loki lounged in a hammock suspended between two oak trees sipping his mead and, and watching the wall grow and grow and grow and there wasn't a single day on which Freya did not descend from her rooms in Asgard to come and watch that wall grow and look at Loki sprawled in the hammock and get angrier and angrier and angrier and there are a few things in the world more frightening than a very angry Freya. Until at length the wall was nine-tenths done. Winter was but a few days away, and given the speed at which this, this pretend man was working, well, there was no doubt in her mind, there was no doubt in the mind of Odin, or of Hodur, or of Baldur, or any of them. There was not a single doubt that this, this creature, whatever he might really be, would complete his pledge in the time scale he had pledged to complete it. And the gods began to talk amongst themselves and say, when Freya is gone, will there be any love in the world? Will there be any passion, any romance, any any offspring in the world? If if all love has gone from the world, then will man turn to woman? Will elf lord turn to elf lady? Will bull turn to cow? Will ram turn to you? Will anyone turn to anyone in passion, in desire? Or will the world fall lonely? and childless and passionless. And what when he takes the sun and the moon away? Yes, we will be well protected, but we will be in pitch darkness. There will be no daytime and no nighttime. What's the good of being safe when you can't see two foot in front of your face? 
God after God went up to Loki and said, I thought you were handling this. I thought you had a cunning plan. Do something. Hurry up. Do something. You're the clever one. You're the cunning one. Get out of that bloody hammock. Put your knee down and do something. Until the day came when the, the wall was, was three massive great boulders short of being completed, Freya stormed out of Asgard, armed to the teeth, ready to eviscerate Loki upon the spot. And there she found an empty hammock and an empty needhorn left besides it. Where he had gone, she did not know although her first reaction was to assume that he had seen her coming and legged it. In fact, Loki had gone down through the remaining gap in the wall onto the other side, just out of Asgard itself, had followed in the tracks of the wagon and the hoof prints of the horse and the footprints of the thing pretending to be a man down to the land of the dwarves where the great mountains are, where they'd gone to get the final massive chunks of rock to finish off the wall. And there he saw, eventually, that great wagon parked up. And the man, except the man now, was no longer the size of a man. He was enormous clearly a giant. He, he was 50 foot tall if he was an inch, picking up gargantuan lumps of rock, straining even his muscles, massive as he was, even his muscles were straining, sweat was pouring down his face, he was wincing and grasping and heaving and heaving these massive great chunks of rock onto the back of this wagon which somehow could take the weight, could clearly this, this wagon was as magical as the horse that pulled it. And the horse itself had been unharnessed. It was off chewing some grass at the side. And Loki, who was prepared to do whatever it takes to win on this occasion, as indeed on most occasions it has to be said, shifted and turned and changed and moved and recited the ancient Galda songs that transformed him from dashing flame-haired god to the biggest, most beautiful mare you have ever seen in your life. And that mare cantered along the edge of the woods at the slopes of the mountain and whinnied and looked across at the great stallion that normally was pulling the wagon. And Zvathilfari, for such was his name, hear, hearing this, this charming whinny, looked across and saw this, this horse that was, oh, the Sophia Loren of Horston. He looked her up and down, he, he caught a glimpse of those fetlocks, that swishing mane from a Pantheon advert. Those beautiful great brown eyes, those flared nostrils, that swishing tail, and he was in horsey love. He was off, off, into the woods. And the mare, as befits all mares, did not give in too easily, for whenever the stallion came near she would canter away from him and the stallion would follow and the mare would coquettishly flick her mane and go a little further and a little further and a little further until they were miles deep into the great forest at the roots of the mountain and for seven days and seven nights the forest was agog with the whinnying and, uh, and the neighing and the thrusting and the sweating and the heaving and the gasping and the humping so vigorous was the humping that the very forest itself was shaking. And all of this while, the master builder was tearing his hair out to find where his stallion had gone. He looked up, he looked down, he looked through the woods, but 
whenever Loki, now in his new disguise, heard the stomping of the giant's foot, he would canter off in the fag breaks between humping and lead Svatilvari deeper and deeper into the woods, away from where the giant was looking. Well, the time for the completion of the war came and went. The giant eventually despaired of finding his stallion and tried to heave the cart himself. But such was the magical nature of the cart that it could only be pulled by the horse. And when the giant put the, the halter around his own neck, he heaved, he pulled, he sweated. All that happened was that the cart collapsed as, as he managed to yank great chunks of wood off it and the whole thing fell into matchsticks beneath the weight of the massive boulders piled into the back of it. And that giant, he roared, he thundered, he shouted, he stomped, the earth shook, the skies quaked with the obscenity of his, his ranting and raging and, and, uh, and roaring. For he knew, he knew one of these gods had somehow tricked him. And that horse had not gone of its own accord. And at length, when the time was well past, an even so magical a stallion as Zafilfari had spent his every last effort in pleasuring this mysterious mare, and he staggered, bandy-legged, cross-eyed, sweating, exhausted, shagged half senseless, back to where the shattered wagon lay beneath the great boulders. He saw the giant storming ahead, effing and blinding and swearing and ranting, up to the land of Asgard, up to call Odin out, to say, you have tricked me. This, this contract is invalid. But Odin said, and he should know, for he is an oath lord, this contract is valid, retains itself. Ula, they summoned, who is an oath lord. And he said, no, this contract retains itself. Thor, they summoned, who is an oath lord. And he said, no, this contract retains itself. You have reneged on the deal of the contract. The wall is incomplete. First frost has already fallen. The season has turned. You will not be paid for the work you have done. You will not receive the Lady Freya as a wife. And her cries of joy could be heard the length and breadth of the nine realms. You will not receive the sun nor the moon as your personal playthings. You will receive nothing. And the giant, now no longer even bothering to disguise himself as a scruffy little man, roared and thundered and shook and said he would tear down the wall, he would tear down Asgard itself. And before it even lifted the first boulder out of the wall, Thor snatched up Mjolnir, his great magical warhammer, and shattered the giant's head into a thousand pieces. And it is said that bits of the giant's skull can still be seen embedded into the walls of Asgard to this very day. And with the aid of the magical stallion, which the gods eventually got onto their side, the remaining boulders were brought up, the stones prepared and slotted into place, and the last bit, that very last bit of the wall was completed, and Asgard remains impregnable. Which is more than can be said for Loki. For having been rogered five ways to Yule by Safil Thari, Loki, the mayor, as he or she was now, had fallen pregnant and could not revert to any other shape but the shape they were in, for to do so would harm the child within the mayor's womb. And so Loki was not seen for many a long month in Asgard, as he skulked off, nurturing the child within his, her womb, until the day when the child was born. A horse 
like its father, like its mother, but a magical horse, like Loki. For Loki's magic, and the, the stallion's magic, was within that, that little foal. So when it was born, it was born not with four legs, as any ordinary foal is, but with eight. And this, this strange beast, of course, became Sleipnir, and was given as a gift to Odin, for Odin to ride throughout the Nine Realms. And Sleipnir can ride upon wind, can ride upon water, can ride upon earth, can ride upon fire as easily as each other. But therein is another story, and the end of this one. Which brings us to our third and final story, for which we journey not terribly far to the lands of Lithuania. Long, long ago, a beautiful young woman, Egle, journeyed with her siblings down to the lake's edge. It was a hot day and they wanted to paddle their feet in the waters and then take the air, uh, just enjoy life a little bit, for all of their labours were done and dusted for that day. And there they sat, enjoying the ways of the world. And the other siblings had nodded off when Egle was startled awake by the presence of something wiggling into the sleeve of her robe. And there she looked up and she saw an exceedingly large snake nestling inside the hoop of her sleeve. And she was really quite frightened, for everyone knew that snakes could be dangerous things, poisonous things. And she said to the snake, please leave, please, 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 don't bite me, don't, don't, please, don't bite me, just, just wiggle out, just leave, please, 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 just leave. And the snake reared its head and said to her, I will leave, you beautiful young thing, if you pledge to marry me. And having overcome the shock of being spoken to by a snake, she said eventually, Oh, oh all right then, just, just anything, just, just leave, just go, go on, ow, 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 ow. And the serpent wriggled away, disappearing into the grass. And Egle, initially at least, thought no more of it. Well, she was quite su surprised in thinking about the fact that a snake could talk and would want to marry a human. It was a little bit odd as well. But once the snake was gone, such was her relief that she certainly didn't imagine she would be held to her word that she would marry a snake. And that never occurred to her. And on the walk home later on that day, she told her siblings about the snake and they said, you must have been dreaming, you must have imagined it. Snakes don't talk in any way, even if snakes could talk. Why would a snake want to marry a human? I mean, that makes no sense whatsoever. And they arrived home. And they'd barely got into the house and had something to drink when they heard hissing and hissing and hissing and hissing and hissing. And both Egle and her siblings and her parents looked out the window and they saw not one snake, but a thousand snakes, a thousand grass snakes filling the courtyard, hissing and slithering and, and wriggling and, and sliding over each other and over the tables and chairs and the doorsteps and up the window frames and through the trees and anywhere else they could find to hiss and slither. And they were terrified. And the biggest of these snakes reared its head and said to Egle's father, I come, I come, sir, to take your daughter's hand in marriage to our king, the king of the grass snakes. And Egle had to explain what had happened earlier, and everyone in the family was surprised, for although her siblings had heard it, they, they, they thought it was all a dream, and here was dream made reality. Not only a talking snake, but a snake that expected this pledge of marriage to be kept. Well, her father thought, well, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? And an idea came to him. 
he snatched up a goose from the kitchen floor where it had been pecking scraps of food out of the rushes on the floor and said, this is, this is my daughter, take her, take her back to the king of the snakes. And the snakes, hissing and spitting and slithering, picked up the goose and carried her majestically out of the courtyard. And they'd gone halfway up the lane carrying this goose when a cuckoo high up in the branches looked down and said, you silly snakes, that's not Eggley, that's not even a human, that's a goose, you've been tricked. And the snakes, spitting with rage, dumped the goose and went back to the courtyard and this time even more angrily demanded Eggley. And the mother, thinking cunningly to herself, tried the same trick again and she picked up a sheep and handed it to the snakes, and the snakes slithered out, hissing and spitting as they went, until they got to the same tree where the same cuckoo sat up there, and the cuckoo looked down and said, oh, you dozy snakes, do you really not know the difference between a sheep and a human? That's a sheep, you've been tricked again. And the snakes went back, and the third time, the third time Eggley's eldest brother tried the same trick with a young cow. And the same thing happened, that, that wretched cuckoo gave the game away. And this time when the snakes went back to the courtyard, the biggest of the snakes said, if you do not give us your daughter this time, we will bite you all. And so this time, as, as a, a, a family unit, they all thought, well, let's, we're, we're, We've gotten away with it three times, we can be, we're not going to manage a fourth time, and if they're going to bite us to death, well, we'll just have to come up with some other solution to this problem later on. And they handed over Egle, and she went, carried upon the backs of the serpents, who paused at the tree, looked up at the cuckoo, and the cuckoo said, well done! And they went off, 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 mile upon mile upon mile down to the lake, the great lake. And the waters of the Great Lake began to boil and churn and rumble and foam, great, great banks of foam upon the waters. And out of the foamy waters emerged a gargantuan snake, a snake so big that it took Eccles' breath away. And as she watched, the snake shifted and turned and changed and became a human the most handsome man she had ever seen in her life, richly and exotically dressed in green robes, as green as, as the skin of the snake he had been but a moment beforehand. And he introduced himself as Zil Zilvinus, sorry, Zilvinus, I'll get the name right, that I am Zilvinus, king of the snakes. It is I who asked you for your hand in marriage. It is you who promised me your hand in marriage. And I invite you now to come to my palace beneath the waters and see the land into which you will become queen. And what else could she do when faced with a remarkably handsome and well-dressed man and an army of hissing snakes but take up the offer? She stretched out her hand, he took it, and the waters opened before them, and they went down and down and down. Somehow she found she could breathe under the waves of this lake. Deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper they went, until eventually they came to the land beneath the waves. A land that was a series of caverns, a dry realm, beneath the waters of the great lake. And there was the palace of the king of the grass snakes, and it was huge and luxurious, decorated in every shape and guise, the most impressive building Eglay had ever seen in her entire life. And this, this snake husband of hers, he proved to be not simply handsome, but kind and clever and funny and charming and, and courteous and, and everything you could possibly want in a husband. He doted upon her at great length. And for nine long years she lived as queen of the grass snakes in the kingdom of the grass snakes. And she had four children, three sons and a daughter, sired by the king of the grass snakes. Her life was, was joyful, it was 
better than anything she could have ever expected up amongst the humankind. But she never kept her humanity secret from her children, who were half snake, half human. They were, although they looked human, they were a mixture of snake people and, and humankind. And they had odd things about them. Their eyes, the forked tongue, their way of walking, their way of thinking. Giveaways that they were half snake and half human. She never hid her humanity from them. She never hid the fact that she had come from a very different world from this world, from her children. And in the ninth year of her eldest child, he asked her, what is life like amongst the humans? In what way is that world different from our world? For he had never known any world other than, than the kingdom of the grass snakes. And she began to describe to him the differences that um, they had stars, for example, in their world because they had sky. Uh, and the trees were different and the animals were different and the customs were different and the styles of dress were different and so on. Uh, and the more she described the differences in her homeland to her child, the more homesick she grew the more she began to miss her brothers, her sisters, her mother, her father, her various relatives. She really did miss, miss them, and, and at length she went to her husband and said to Zilvanus, I should very much like to visit my family and to take my children that they might see what their aunts and their uncles and their grandparents are like. That they have never seen them and, and my brothers and sisters and my parents don't even know that I have children now. For all they know, I, I drowned in the lake. They, they have no idea that I am still alive and so very happy and, and have such a thriving family of my own. I, I would love to go back. I, I, I just miss, miss them so much. And the king of the grass snakes was very, very reticent to let her go because he feared that once she was up there, Maybe her family would not want to part with her a second time, would try to keep hold of her and restrain her. And, and so he tried to put roadblocks in her way to make it difficult. And he said, well, you can go, but you must perform certain tasks first. You must perform, I know, you must take this, this tuft of silk and you must spin it. And you can't go until it's finished spinning. And she said, fair enough. And she took this tuft of silk and, and went off to her spinning room where she kept her spinning wheel. And she spun and spun and spun and spun and spun. And no matter how much she spun the damn thing, the, 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 the tuft itself never got any smaller. Even when she had produced enough silk thread to fill half the room, the tuft itself, from which she was drawing the thread, remained exactly the same size. It, it was impossible, but that's what was happening. And she realised her husband had worked some magic to prevent her from ever going, because she'd never be able to complete this task. Um, she began to despair, and she went to think, who do, who do I know? Who do I know who is wise, who understands the ways of this world, the ways of my husband and his magic? And the only person she could think of was the old woman in the cave, who lived a way off outside the palace, this wise woman. And she went to visit the wise woman and she said, I have to spin this tuft and no matter what I do, it doesn't get any smaller. And the wise woman said, well, what you must do is throw that tuft into the fire and see for yourself what happens then. Then you'll be okay. Negle was a little, little uncertain of this at first, but I thought, well, I, I have to give it a go. I have to try. And she went back to her spinning room and she took the tuft of silk and threw it into the fire. And it crackled and it burnt. And as it dissipated away, there instead was a big fat toad. And the toad coming out of its mouth 
was an endless line of silk. She didn't even have to spin it herself. It was just coming out, a great silk thread out of the toad's mouth, piling up and piling up and piling up. She watched for a good half hour as the silk piled up and piled up until finally the toad croaked. And the last of the silk came out and the tuft was gone. The spinning was done and there was an enormous amount of thread which she round on to bobbin after bobbin after bobbin. And it was all finished and all done. And at length, at the end of that day, she went to her husband and said, Look, I have spun the thread. Now I can go. And her husband, <laughs> a bit of a moan and a groan to himself, and said, Well, there is, there is another task you must do. Another task before you can go. And he opened a chest and he took out two big clod hopping shoes, like, like clogs. But instead of being carved from wood, they were made from solid iron. And he said, Put these on, they're just your size. When these have worn away to nothing, then, then you can go up and visit your family. And Eglay had a bit of a of her own and thought, when is this ever going to end? But she put on the iron shoes and she clonked around, sounding like she was a, a, a knight in shining armour, clonking around an entire suit of armour. Up and down the stairs, she went in and out of room, she went round and round and round and round, round the palace. And at the end of the day, she had thoroughly knacked herself out from walking everywhere. And she looked at the iron shoes, and there was a, a mark on them, not, a, not, not the slightest sign of erosion. And she thought to herself, I, I could probably be wearing these for the next 20 years, and then they'd scarcely even be worn away, let alone worn away to nothing. And she remembered the old woman in the cave. And so she went off back the next day to the old woman and showed her the iron shoes and said, what do I do? What do I do? And the old woman said, take these to a blacksmith. Ask the blacksmith to wear them away to nothing for you. It'll take a while, but, but he'll do it. And so she went to the palace blacksmith, who of course was one of the grass snakes, and showed him the shoes and he took them and put them in the furnace and heated them up white and beat them and beat them and beat them and beat them, and beat them with hammers. And then when they cooled down again, they were much thinner. And she showed the shoes to her husband at the end of that day, and he saw that they were a lot thinner. <laughs> Three days it took of going back and forth, back and forth to the blacksmith and hammering them away and thinning them out and heating them up and cooling them down, until eventually on the third day they were just gone, worn to nothing, just, just tiny little scraps of iron no longer holding together the shoes. And she was able to show these worn down scraps to her husband. And he, he, he had a bit of a moment going, so there's, there's one more thing, one last thing. Just, just one last thing. I want you to bake rabbit pie. And she said, oh, easy enough, easy, easy. He said, however, however, you can only use the tools that are in the kitchen. And as she set off to go for the kitchen, he summonsed his fastest page boy and said in the lad's ears and the page boy zoomed off like lightning to the kitchen and he took every wooden spoon he took every bowl anything that wasn't nailed down he had it away out of the kitchen and hid it and so by the time Eggley arrived in the kitchen there was flour and eggs and rabbit meat and this and that and the other but there was no knives no bowls no spoons Nothing with which you could make a pie. No, no utensils of any shape, form or description. And she did her best. But when you've been brought up as, as the, the daughter of a wealthy family with servants to cook for you, and then you've become a queen and, and you've had an army of servants to cook for you, what she knew of, of kitchen work, you could have written on the back of a stamp. And so, despairingly, the next day, she went back to the wise woman in the cave and said, look, this is the last thing I have to do. And she explained about making the rabbit pie and then being a bit clueless and not knowing what the hell to do. And the old woman said, is there anything in the kitchen at all? Anything that you can use? And Eglay thought, well, she looked in every cupboard and every drawer, everywhere she could find to look. All she'd found which obviously the page boy hadn't managed to, to ferret away in time, 
was an old sieve and a stone, an old bit of flint that was used to prop the door open as a doorstop. And the old woman said, well, use those, use the sieve as a bowl, dip it in water, and then you can shape your flour into the pastry in the sieve. And that bit of flint that you're using as a doorstop, smash it upon the flagons of the floor, the flagstones, and you will find the flint is sharp enough to chop the rabbit meat. And she went back to the kitchen and she took the sieve and she dipped it in, in a bucket of water and she poured flour into the sieve and, and the, the flour clogged the, the holes in the sieve because it was now damp and she was able to use it as a bowl to knead and shape the flour to make it into pastry and add in the fat and everything else. And she shattered the flint and she used the sharp edge of one of the bits to chop up the rabbit meat and she was able to make the rabbit pie and bake it and such a big pie she served it at dinner to her husband who enjoyed it even though he was moaning and groaning that he didn't have to let his wife go to the, the land of humans and, and she fed her children and, and everyone was happy ish the next day at dawn she awoke and the servants had packed her bags and packed the children's bags her husband would not come with her this was his kingdom he, he did not belong in the land of humans and he said to her, look, if you ever need to call me, to summons me, you need aid getting away, you need aid coming back here. You must say this spell. And he told her in the ancient snake tongue, the spell. And if you see the waters bubbling and foaming, and they are as white as milk, that means I am on the way to rescue you. And if you see the waters foaming and bubbling and they are as red as blood, it means that I have died and I cannot come and rescue you. <sighs> Very well, she said. Very well. And she went with her children up through the waters, her husband taking her all of the way, having resumed the shape of an enormous snake, slithering and sliding through the waters, his wife and his children wrapped in his coils, for he was an enormous snake, till they arrived at the banks of the lake, and there he uncurled himself, and his children and his wife stepped out of those coils onto dry land. And he told them again of the, the spell, and he reminded the wife and he reminded his children this was the spell they had to say in order to summon him from the bottom of the lake, in order to escape back down to the kingdom of the grass snakes. Well, they made their journey, she could remember the way, even though it was nine years, up to the house of her parents, who were still alive, as were all of her brothers and sisters. And there was an enormous family reunion, a rejoicing time, a banquet, a feast. They were kind and caring and loving, and they, they, they were amazed she was even still alive, but the fact that she had children, and they listened to her tales of her wonderful extravagant life in the palace of the grass snakes and all the stories of, of, of her husband or, or Vilvinus and, and how wonderful he was and kind he was and caring he was and one thing and another he was. And her sisters grew jealous and her brothers grew resentful and the more they listened to this the more they thought to themselves if she goes back there we will never see her again. We must do something to keep her here. And after the feast was over and they're all going off to bed and one thing and another, the brothers met up outside of the house, the edge of the garden where it was quiet and they couldn't be overheard, and they discussed what to do. And they came to the conclusion that the only viable thing for them to do was to murder their brother-in-law, and thus set their sister free to marry a, a human, instead of marrying this weird snake, man, shape shifting thing, demon, creature, whatever the hell he was. Well, how do we summon him? How do we cause him to appear from this distant group? We've no idea where the kingdom of the snake people is, so we, how do we get him here? Well, one of the brothers had overheard his nephew talking to his niece about a spell that had been they could use to summon their father. And so they decided they would have to get the information out of their nephews and nieces. And so the very next day, the 
brothers, the uncles, decided that they would invite their nephews down to the lake edge to have a picnic. And the nephews all went along quite innocently. Uh, when they arrived at the lake edge, they found that the picnic basket, when it was opened up, contained no bread, no cheese, no meats, no apples, no cakes, no food of any description. Instead, it contained wooden rods and leather straps. And the uncles took up the leather straps and the wooden rods and they said to their nephews, tell us the spell to summon your father. And the boy, first of the boys that they asked, refused. And so they started beating seven shades out of him with the straps and the rods, thrashing merry hell out of the boy. And still he refused to disclose the spell, for he could see quite easily that his uncles meant nothing but mayhem and mischief. Uh, and that the boy didn't want his father falling victim to these thuggish uncles. And eventually they beat the boy so badly he passed out. And then they set about the second boy, who again refused to disclose the spell that would summon his father. And they thrashed him and they beat him and they beat him and they thrashed him until he too passed out, still without giving the secret away. And finally the third boy suffered the same fate as his, his two brothers. And when all three boys were laying unconscious and bruised and battered and bleeding upon the floor, the uncles went back to the house and they fetched the niece and dragged her down and they showed her the bodies of her brothers, alive though they were, but battered and bruised and bleeding and, and, and awful. And they said, if you don't tell us, you'll suffer the same fate as them. And they took up the rods and they took up the belts and they were about to lay into her. When, quaking and shivering and shaking and terrified, she blurted out the ancient spell. And the uncles pushed her away to the edge of the woods and, and moved away this, the unconscious bodies of their nephews. And they took out each of them, sickles and subjects. They were a farming family. And they stood on the edge of the Great Lake and they recited this ancient rune in the snake tongue, the snake language. They hissed and slithered and slithered and hissed and sang this, this rune and the waters of the Great Lake began to bubble and foam and churn and turn white as milk and then out of the Great Waters emerged this gigantic snake. And even as the great snake began to take on the shape of a man again, the handsome father, barely had, had he assembled his human guise, then his brother-in-laws were setting about him with sickles and scythes, hacking and slashing and ripping and tearing, gutting and gouging and poking. Uh, and the poor man was dead before his foot touched dry land, hacked into a hundred pieces. And the brothers celebrated their achievement and said, right, our sister can stay with us now and our nephews and nieces can stay with us and we will marry our sister off to a good human man, uh, one of us, one, one, one of the people of the village, uh, a, a normal human rather than this, this snake demon thing. And the brothers set off to find their sister. And they announced to her what they thought was the joyous news and she wept and she wailed and she sobbed and she said she didn't believe them. She, she couldn't, they were her brothers, they would never be so wicked and they'd never be so brutal. And so they said, we'll show you the corpse and then you'll know that you're free. You're free of him. You can marry someone of our choosing rather than this, this monster. And they took her down to the edge of the lake and she saw the battered unconscious bodies of her sons and she saw the, the, the her daughter quivering and shaking and sobbing, hiding amongst the bushes, pointing towards the mangled body of her father, bits of him here, a hand here, a foot there, an ear somewhere else, his entrails splattered upon the rocks. And she screamed and she wailed and she wept. And she said to her brothers, I, I loved him. This was no burden to me to be with her. He was the love of my life will always be the love of my life. And she began to sing a song of her own, a spell of her own. 
for she had learnt much in the land of grass snakes. Her three brave sons, who had withstood the brutality of their uncles to keep their father's secret, she weaved spells around them, and one woke up and turned, shifting and changing into a great, enormous, mighty oak, towering above the edge of the lake. And the next woke up, and he turned into a great and mighty ash tree, vast and tall, stood by the edge of the lake. And the third woke up, and he turned into a great and mighty birch tree, silvery and drooping his branches into the waters of the lake. And then to her daughter, quaking and shaking in the bushes and sobbing, who fear had got the better of, she began to sing her song and weave her spells. And the daughter stood up and grew and shifted and turned into an asper, whose leaves quiver and shake in the wind from that day to this. And of herself, she sang the last verse of her spell. And she grew and shifted and turned and changed and became a mighty spruce, towering over the edge of the lake. And as for her brutal brothers, well, what became of them, nobody knows and frankly, nobody cares. For that is the end of the story and the end of this set of three. Thank you for listening.